This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The United Kingdom begins a new chapter after Brexit, but many uncertainties remain. A new era beckons as African continental free trade area comes into force. And the World Health Organization has cleared the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for emergency use. Hello and welcome. You're watching Africa Live. We're coming to you live from Nairobi. I'm Hannah Vivier. Here more stories making headlines this hour. In business news, we look at the genesis of the UK's historic exit from the European Union. And in your sport, Kenyan para rower Miriam Amakobe is still chasing Tokyo Paralympics ticket. We begin in the UK, where after years of challenging talks, not to mention warnings of disaster and promises of prosperity, Brexit has finally taken effect. Negotiators sealed a trade deal on Christmas Eve, just days before the end of the 11th month transition period. CDTN's Guy Henderson reports from London. In the French port of Calais, there was uneasiness as the clock ticked down. Britain is just 30 kilometres across the water from here. Through the decades, its citizens have become a mainstay of economic life. Businesses like Calais Van didn't know to what extent that would continue after midnight. The key word is uncertainties, says its manager, Jerome Pont. French customs was on edge too. They may know how border checks will work from now on. But with the EU-UK trade deal coming through so last minute, customs officer Gilbert Beltran's question was, will traders themselves get it right? De cette On the other side in Dover, hauliers waited to see if more checks and confusion might lead to delays in both directions, with all the resulting extra costs. If we, if we can only manage to do three trips a week instead of four out of Belgium, then that means that our cost per trip increase, which we would have to pass on to our customer, which ultimately means that you and I are going to pay more for that product uh, in the supermarket. The Christmas Eve deal reached between the EU and UK supposedly seals the final phase of an ordeal that's lasted longer than many expected and which at times looked close to falling apart with no deal at all. On New Year's Eve, French President Emmanuel Macron's message was a conciliatory one. The Royaume-Uni remains our voisin, but also our friend. This year, In his own end-of-year address, Prime Minister Boris Johnson promised unity going forward. This is an amazing moment for this country. We have our freedom in our hands, and it is up to us to make the most of it. And I think it will be the overwhelming instinct of the people of this country to come together as one united kingdom. That will be no easy task. Scotland wanted to remain, its devolved leadership seeks independence. And Northern Ireland is part of the UK, but still also within the EU's single market. But don't forget a majority still voted for Brexit in that 2016 referendum, and many still support it. We're fine. I think it's good. I think we should go back to being an island. And so, at 11pm local time on Thursday, the 31st of December 2020, the time finally came. The transition phase is now over. After years of prosperity, all those warnings of impending decline, only now will the full reality of Brexit begin to become apparent. Guy Henderson, CGTN, London. Let's get more on that story. We're now joined by CGTN's Nicole Johnson, who is in London. Nicole, thank you so much for joining us. The UK finally leaving the EU. What happens now? Well, first of all, we have to wait and see just how complicated the process is of actually putting this deal into practice. And that's something that will take some time for us to see how it really plays out. 
Some of the most immediate things that the British people will see, of course, is the fact that they have lost their freedom of movement in Europe, so that's going to make travel in some respects far more complicated. They will no longer have that sort of unrestricted right to work and holiday across the European Union. So, for example, it means that if they want to spend more than three months in any six-month period inside the EU, they'll need to get a visa. So that's a big change for people. Some of the other practical changes that were agreed upon in the sort of dying embers of the negotiations related to fishing, that was a really big issue. Now the value of the European Union's fishing catch inside British waters will be reduced by 25 per cent, and that's something that will be phased phased in over the next five and a half years. And one of the other big points was the level playing field. And on that, the UK has agreed to continue to commit and abide to uh, European Union standards on workers' rights and certain social and economic regulations. But still, it will be many months until we see just how this deal will be put into practice. Nicole, one of the other complications that has been discussed at length has been those fears that there would be delays and disruptions at the borders. What is the situation now and what are you hearing about how they plan to tackle that? Well, right now that really is the big issue and what we've seen so far over this weekend or what we're expecting to see is a pretty quiet weekend. There isn't a huge amount of sort of a traffic and trucks and lorries crossing and that's because it's a bank holiday here it's the new year's long weekend so we're expecting that on the 4th of january next week that traffic will pick up and then we will really see how all of these rules and customs regulations paperwork and bureaucracy is going to impact upon truck drivers and on supplies and we got a sense of that over the last week when the French government decided that it would no longer allow trucks that were inside the UK to head into France until they'd had a negative COVID-19 test. We saw that huge backlog of trucks. So the concern is that we could see similar scenes repeated. Now, the British government says that it's prepared for a reasonable worst case scenario whereby only 30% of truck drivers have their paperwork in place and ready. They say that they have contingencies, a couple of large docking areas set up so that if we see you know, big delays and large numbers of trucks stuck at the border, that there is something in place. But the other concern is for businesses and exporters. Some of the recent studies have found that up to 50% of small and medium-sized businesses here in the UK say that they're not ready, that the regulations and the paperwork and this deal came in simply too late for them to work out what to do. So we'll see over the next couple of weeks exactly what kind of scramble it is for people to get all of these regulations in place so that trade can start to resume normally. Thank you so much for that. Nicole Johnston joining us from London. Well, it's meant to be a game changer in African regional and international trade. And while the coronavirus pandemic stalled it, the implementation of the African continental free trade area has come into force. Nabil Ahmed Rafai reports in the Ghanaian capital of Accra. It's a landmark achievement, the African Continental Free Trade Area, or AFCFTA a trade deal covering a market of more than 1.2 billion people and up to $3 trillion in combined GDP. The Secretariat was commissioned in Accra in August and handed over to the African Union. We in Ghana believe that an increase in trade is the surest way to deepen regional integration in Africa. It will mean a rapid increase in the exchange of agricultural, industrial, financial, scientific, and technological products, which would significantly enhance our economic fortunes as a continent, create prosperity, and provide opportunities for employment for the broad masses of Africans, particularly the youth. The AFCFTA Secretary's first Secretary General, Wamkele Mene, has a four-year mandate to ensure the smooth operation of the trade deal. Substantial domestic policy reforms and alignment of national legislation with the AFCFTA shall be required in order to reduce barriers to intra-Africa trade. The AFCFTA Secretariat will work closely with customs authorities across Africa to ensure that through robust implementation of the AFCFTA rules of origin, 
the prevention of transshipment is an absolute priority. 36 out of 54 African countries have so far ratified a trade agreement. Africa's largest economy, Nigeria, was slow in making a decision to sign the pact, but finally did before the December 5 deadline. The plan is for it to come into effect in stages over the next several months and years, with a potential of increasing trade amongst African countries by more than 50%. Nabil Ahmed Rufai, CDTN, Accra, Ghana. Let's get some more perspective on that story from Wamke Lemene, the Secretary General of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. He joined us live from Johannesburg, South Africa. Thank you so much for joining us. Mr. Wamke, what are the direct benefits that you can speak to us about members of this free trade agreement? Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, today is a very historic day uh, for us Africans because we have taken a historic milestone to integrating the market on the African continent. From today onwards, exporters, traders, will be able, of course, amongst the 33 countries who have ratified the agreement, their goods will transit through the borders at reduced uh, tariffs. Second, we have now developed a system for dispute settlement amongst ourselves. If there's a commercial investment dispute, we will no longer have to go to Europe to resolve that dispute to the WTO. We will do so in Africa in accordance with our own rules. Third, um, we are designing an interconnectivity uh, application to connect small and medium enterprises who want to take advantage of the African continental free trade area so that if you are a small and medium enterprise in Ghana, you can access the markets in Kenya and you are able to make full use of the new uh, market that uh, this agreement creates and the new opportunities that this agreement um, shall create for millions and millions of Africans, whether it is in small medium enterprises or indeed if we're talking about women in trade and young Africans in trade. I should add that it takes a long time for benefits under a free trade agreement to be seen on the ground. It takes three to four years for an exporter to develop new supply chains to take advantage of the new market. So whilst we have opened the market today, and whilst today you will be able to export your goods at reduced barriers for investment, for trade, for a range of other uh, uh, regulations that we have reduced, that process starts today, but the benefits and the and the and the, the results, it will take time for us um, to see and for ordinary Africans to experience those benefits. And my job and our job is to make sure that that period of Africans being able to access those benefits, that that period is minimized as much as possible. If you look around the world, if you look at trade agreements around the world, takes five to ten years before ordinary citizens see the benefits. We want to make that period of benefiting much, much faster mm -hmm. for Africa. Mr. Mini, speak to us about the preparedness of the continent for the commencement of this free trade, free trade agreement. There are 33 countries who have ratified the agreement, which means that they've accepted the legal obligations. Uh, of the agreement, the obligations uh, to open markets, the rights and obligations that the agreement establishes. And we think that that's a remarkable achievement. It's unprecedented in the history of the African continent. We have been working hard in the last six months. We have been working hard, notwithstanding the delays of COVID-19, to ensure that we have the requisite customs procedures in place so that the trading that takes place from today onwards can actually be commercially meaningful and so that the goods that transit the borders and the services that transit the borders are actually commercially meaningful and they are allowed to transit the borders in accordance with the agreement. And so from a customs, which is the most important part, from a customs readiness point of view, of course, out of 55 countries, we are at different levels of readiness, but you don't need all 55 countries. To, to implement a trade agreement. Those countries that are ready are starting to implement today. 
from a customs point of view. We have designed a system of uh, um, to give credits to traders so that if a particular trader is exporting goods to a country that today may not be ready from a customs point of view, that trader will not be penalized. That trader will get their credit um, starting from, and of course it will be backdated, uh, and it will start from the 1st of January uh, 2021. And so readiness under a trade agreement, I have never heard of a trade agreement where all countries, where all parties to the trade agreement are ready on the same day of implementation. It is very typical that in trade agreements, countries are at different levels of readiness, more especially in the context of COVID-19, where in the last six months, governments have been focused on saving, correctly so, saving the lives of Africans. So we have, I'm very happy because we have, we have a critical mass of countries, 33 countries who have ratified the agreement. Many of them, about 41 of them, have actually signaled readiness to start trading under the new rules of the agreement so that we, as I said earlier, we as Africans take the continent a step closer to an integrated market. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Mene, Mr. Wamkele Mene, Secretary General of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. Well, the World Health Organization has listed the COVID-19 vaccine from Pfizer and BioNTech for emergency use. The organization says it could help countries speed up their own approvals. It says the drug meets its criteria for safety and efficacy. The WHO also emphasizes that the need to ensure supply for priority populations. The organization's chief in his annual address called for more participation in the global COVAX vaccine alliance to ensure access for poorer countries. To protect the world, we must ensure that all people are at risk everywhere, not just in countries who can afford vaccines are immunized. To do this, COVAX needs just over 4 billion US dollars urgently to buy vaccines for low and lower middle income countries. In South Africa, there are concerns whether there will be enough teachers in classrooms when schools reopen in January. South Africa's Department of Basic Education says that the number of deaths among teachers is alarming and there could be an education crisis looming. CGTN's Elisa Jamela reports. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a huge toll on South Africa's education system. About 1,500 teachers have succumbed to the virus this year. In the past week alone, the virus claimed the lives of 32 teachers in one province. That's a large number. It means that there will be some schools where several teachers will not be available, but it also means that there will be classrooms where there will be no teachers. So that to us is a huge concern. It is a looming crisis because we planned with these teachers in mind that they will be coming back to work. And when we finalized our admissions for the following year, the ratio was based on the number of teachers that we already have. And this number from just one reporting province is it's huge. It's actually shocking. So we asked him if the teachers are losing their lives because the education department's COVID-19 protocols are basically failing them. In fact, in school, the protocols are working. That's why after schools reopened, the numbers declined, which means schools contributed to the reduction of the infection rate. Um, but the spike happened after schools closed because people in society, in their own homes, in the streets, there's no control. You go to a party, you go to a funeral, you go to other social activities. Mkhanga says the disruptions to teaching will need a longer time frame to address. If there are going to be any further disruptions, it means that it could take us uh, an even longer, I mean, maybe five years even, to try to recover the loss just that would have resulted from a single year. South Africa's 2020 academic calendar was revised at least twice to accommodate the changes that have been brought by the impact of the coronavirus. With less than a month before schools are due to reopen, Teacher Union Satu has appealed to the Education Department to ensure that pupils and teachers receive psychosocial support in order to deal with the deaths that have been brought on by COVID-19 pandemic. What we did during 
uh, the preparations for the reopening of schools when they were closed, was to work with our NGO partners. We also worked with the Department of Social Development to provide us additional social workers, counsellors who would come to school to provide support to our learners and our teachers. South Africa has surpassed the one million mark of COVID-19 infections. The country is also currently battling a second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. You listen to Jamila for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, time now for us to take a short break. Here's what's coming up when we return. We we'll take a look at the improving relations between Egypt and Sudan. Africa is a continent of diversity with varied climates and enchanting geography and a people so distinct but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Adam Shirishi, Tunis, Cairo, Juba, Johannesburg, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. You're watching News Making Headlines right here on Africa Live. Well, 2020 saw improving relations between Egypt and Sudan as Cairo builds ties with the transitional government in Khartoum. CDT and Adel Amarohi looks back on political, economic and military cooperation between the two countries. Before the Sudanese uprising that led to the military ouster of Omar al-Bashir, relations between Egypt and Sudan were on a downward spiral. Sudan was a safe haven for members of the Muslim Brotherhood, a group on Egypt's terror list. The free movement of people between the two states had been revoked and visas were imposed. During the previous regime, bilateral ties were at their worst. A state of suspicion and mistrust prevailed. The Sudanese revolution is what has balanced out the ties. It stood against the Islamists and avoided a lot of problems that ignited between Sudan and its neighbors. Sudan was basically a shelter for people wanted for justice in Egypt. 2020 witnessed growing political support between the two nations. Egypt was one of the sponsoring countries of the Sudanese peace agreement in Juba. The shift in relations was apparent when Egypt began moderating in the domestic disputes in Sudan and also in lifting Sudan's membership suspension at the African Union. Since then, a series of senior meetings followed and the relations have strongly developed. A flow of Egyptian medical teams and supplies entered Sudan during the COVID-19 pandemic. The year also saw unprecedented military and security cooperation. Nile Eagle 1 became the first joint air force drill between the two nations. At the first stage, the ties were closer with the Sudanese military, which rose suspicions about Cairo's intentions among the civilian power. But quickly, Egypt realized that and balanced its ties with everyone. Now the Sudanese government, with its two branches, are satisfied with the Egyptian relations, especially that now the vital files to Cairo are managed by the civil government that includes the Ethiopia Dam negotiations and the industrial and trade ties. On the economic front, 2020 came to a close with a logistical agreement which enables Sudan to use Egypt's Red Sea ports. Through it, Sudan can export its products to the world and import its domestic needs. 2021 is promising stronger and deeper relations between Egypt and Sudan. Cairo is already promising more scholarships and training programs for Sudanese citizens, and both nations will be working to widen their electricity grid and railroads connectivity. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Ras Sadr, Egypt. The Mauritius-China Free Trade Agreement comes into force today. The FTA was signed in October 2019 in Beijing after negotiations officially began in late 2017. 
The agreement covers trade in goods and, and services as well as investment and economic cooperation. China's Ministry of Commerce says the deal will provide a more powerful institutional guarantee to deepen bilateral trade relations. Well, for more details, we're now joined by correspondent Louis Fei Fei, who is in, who's standing by for us in Mauritius. Louis Fei Fei, what further details can you give us about this agreement? Hi, Anna. Happy New Year to you. The agreement is very momentous on many different levels, but first and foremost, on a macro level, this agreement represents the first free trade agreement that China has entered into with an African country. So all eyes are on this bilateral agreement. Now, the agreement started uh, being negotiated back in 2017, so it's been a long time getting to where we are now. What this agreement really means is that it covers 17 different areas of the bilateral relationship between Mauritius and China. Some of the key ones are going to be the trade and goods and services. And another one that's really important is an economic collaboration. If we break that down in terms of trade uh, and goods. This means that with immediate effect, uh, the Mauritius uh, exporters will now have duty-free access to a consumer market of 1.4 billion uh, potential consumers. This is huge and probably a much-needed boost for the Mauritian economy, which has uh, faced numerous COVID-19-related restrictions. In terms of trade and services, uh, Mauritius will now also have access to a number of service sectors, such as e-commerce, uh, telecommunications, ICT, to just name a few. And as I mentioned, the other interesting aspect is the economic collaboration that's a part of the free trade agreement. The two sides have agreed to work together on uh, industrialized uh, development, on innovative manufacturing, and also to collaborate together to foster financial sectors for both sides. Feifei, you've highlighted some of the benefits. Just speak to us about, about more about that, the two sides, and what they expected to reap from this agreement. I think for Mauritius, first and foremost, that market is going to make a huge, tremendous impact. Historically, there's been a trade imbalance because simply uh, it's just able to produce so many more goods. Uh, and the cost of labor in Mauritius has become high over the years. So now with the removal of the tariffs, a lot of the uh, export sectors that are very important to Mauritius are going to be more competitive. And that's going to include, for example, the frozen fish sector. There's a very vibrant and growing aquaculture industry in Mauritius. Mauritius being an island nation, the ocean economy is key to its sustainable development going forward. So that's going to be an interesting one to watch. Also, um, in rum, Mauritius sugar producing country and one of the beverages that they make is rum and this is going to be something interesting to see in the Chinese market. Uh, also maybe close to the ladies hearts Mauritius also has lovely handcraft jewelry. So these are just some examples of services where uh, goods where Mauritius can now become more competitive in China. Uh, in terms of for China, Mauritius has always been a strategic partner. It was one of the first African countries to establish formal diplomatic ties with China back in 1972 with the first uh, foreign embassy established in China. And since then, the two countries have enjoyed a good uh, working relationship together. Now, Mauritius is also a strategic location in the Indian Ocean. And Mauritius has also held it out increasingly so in recent years as a conduit for Asian countries that want to invest and play a role in Africa, which is something definitely China wants to do. So there's a benefit to both countries. But as I began this sector by saying, Anna, I think it's the, the larger, more over-encompassing aspect is that this is the first free trade agreement that China has into, entered into with an African country. And indeed, I'm sure other countries on the continent are watching with keen eyes. Fei Fei, thank you so much for those very detailed specifics. It's always good to be able to hear the details of an agreement such as this one. Thank you, Fei Fei, joining us live from Mauritius. Well, more responses are coming in regarding Chinese President Xi Jinping's New Year's speech. 
in South Africa, Professor Leratodi Leo from the Physics and Astronomy Department at the University of the Western Cape, said that the Chinese lunar exploration program known as Chang'e Project would benefit my mankind. He also asserted that South African scholars were likely to work with their Chinese counterparts to carry out laboratory measurements on the lunar samples brought back by Chang'e 5. The Chang'e 5 mission is a very, very important mission globally. From China is part of a big program of the exploration of the moon and other planets beyond. So um, a program uh, to study uh, the moon, um, its makeup um, uh, and its evolution and, and, and possibly how um, to uh, you know, uh, get humans there, certainly uh, about establishing a research base um, on the moon. And then from there, uh, possibly go to other planets as Mars. Yeah, we've definitely um, enjoyed some um, bilateral and uh, multilateral uh, collaborations between South Africa uh, and China. Um, and uh, this mission definitely uh, provides uh, an opportunity uh, to grow and build uh, on that. Meanwhile, Moroccan experts have also commented on China's contribution to fighting COVID-19 while exhibiting a strong anti-epidemic spirit. The Chinese people showed a great anti-epidemic spirit. They finally won the stage of anti-epidemic victory, especially the successful development of Chinese vaccines, and made great contributions to the people of the world in defeating the virus. China has formulated a convincing 14th five-year plan for future development. At the same time, the Chinese people have completed building a well of society in an all-round way and made great historic achievements. Your business news is coming up after the break. Here's what you can expect. We'll look at the genesis of the UK's historic exit from the European Union. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. Time now for the business news. The UK has left the European Union as a post-Brexit trade deal comes into effect. Our reporter Andrew Wilson looks back at the roots of the historic breakup. From the very start, this was a battle of red lines. Red lines that became ever clearer as this determined divorce dragged on for four and a half years. Looking back, anti-Europe factions had been noisy for decades, but were always seen as unrepresentative of the public at large. In 2015, to appease and silence them, then Prime Minister David Cameron allowed a referendum. In hindsight, that was as reckless as the ensuing complacency of his Remain campaign. We are approaching one of the biggest decisions this country will face in our lifetimes, whether to remain in a reformed European Union or to leave. Because in 2016, an apparently comfortable status quo was suddenly overturned. And Cameron's political career was over. But I do not think it would be right for me to try to be the captain that steers our country to its next destination. The UK first joined the European Union's forerunner, the EEC, in 1973. It was an uneasy alliance from the start. Britain, semi-detached from Europe, never fully in, turning its back on monetary union in the 90s to keep sterling over the European currency. With Cameron suddenly gone, his successor, Theresa May, took the reins but was quickly identified by the emboldened Brexit lobby 
as too reasonable for the task ahead. She needed a mandate and called a snap election in 2017, but instead of increasing her majority, she lost it. She was now at the mercy of lawmakers who repeatedly savaged her attempts at compromise with Brussels. The red lines were getting clearer. The eyes to the right, 202. The nose to the left, 432. So the nose have it, the nose have it. And so after three failed attempts to win support for her deal, May had to throw in the towel. I do so with no ill will but with enormous and enduring gratitude to have had the opportunity to serve the country I love. And therefore I give notice that Boris Johnson is elected as the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. Boris Johnson was the Brexiteer's choice. He brought energy and determination to the cross-channel divorce project. Because we're going to restore trust in our democracy and we're going to fulfil the repeated promises of Parliament to the people and come out of the EU on October the 31st. No ifs or buts. Statement, the Prime Minister. Johnson wanted it done, and when MPs tried to check his progress as they'd done with May, he pushed back hard. At one point last September, he actually suspended Parliament for five weeks, an unprecedented move that was ruled illegal by the UK's Supreme Court. Like May, Johnson went to the country for support. A snap election, and in December, was a bold, high-risk move. But unlike May, he won a resounding victory. A hefty majority of 80 meant on getting Brexit done, he had the public's support. The Eurosceptics could leave him to get on with it. The withdrawal agreement became law in February 2020 and negotiations began for a new deal. Only then did those red lines dividing a new UK sovereignty with privileged access to the European single market start to paint themselves in the public sphere. The symbolic issue of fishing rights and the economic practicalities of a level playing field took on such importance that the negotiators exhausted themselves trying to gain even an inch from the other side. We keep calm, as always, and uh, if there is still a way, we will see. Thank you, au revoir. And on the 24th of December, Christmas Eve, the negotiators reported agreement, the bare bones of a trade deal. There was plenty missing, but the stumbling blocks had been overcome. Just six days later, the leaderships of the two sides, separately now, put historic pens to pay. And the doubters in the UK Parliament, still angry at the sheer speed of the process, were overwhelmed and the trade deal went into law. The eyes to the right, 521. Yeah. The nose to the left, 73. Yeah. In reality, there is still much to be negotiated and fought over. Andrew Wilson, CGTN. Well, let's turn to the environment now. 2020 saw one of the largest oil spills in the world after the Japanese ship MV Wakashio crashed into a coral reef in Mauritius. That tragedy led to one of the worst environmental disasters in the country's history. Xu Tian's Fei Fei Liu takes us back to the July 2020 incident, as well as other global oil spills of the past. Hi there, everybody. I am Liu Fei Fei, and I'm a correspondent with CGTN Africa. Today, we are in a beautiful, beautiful endemic forest. In fact, this place is called Ilo Zigret, and it's nothing short of absolutely magical. Uh, the Ilo Zigret in English means the island of egrets, and it's a tiny island off the coast of a tiny island nation called Mauritius. This is a second visit this year for me to Ilo Zigret because unfortunately, in August of this year, the island, together with the nation of Mauritius, suffered its worst environmental disaster ever. When the Japanese freight ship Wakashio, uh, which ran aground back in July, on August 6th, the Wakashio actually started leaking oil. And the Wakashio was actually just about two kilometers downstream from Ila Zigret. And so a lot of the oil and the toxic fumes came onto this island. Let me tell you a little bit more about Ila Zigret and why this place is so special. So this is a tiny island the size of 26 hectares. Uh, for those of you who are not so good with measurements, 
which I am one of, this is roughly 32 football fields or about 26 rugby fields. So that's how small this island was. And on this island is a tiny microcosm of what Mauritius was like before it was so-called discovered by humans back in the 1700s. So this island had all the native uh, endemic animals and plants, but they all died and people actually tried to settle here. And in fact, I think the British uh, came and they built a fort here. But back in the 1960s, uh, the government actually designated this island as a nature reserve. And soon afterwards, the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation took over and started meticulously restoring the island to its, well, uh, state before it was discovered. So to restore it back to its natural state. And it was doing a fantastic job. It was a nature reserve and they had brought back um, to life from the brink of extinction, a lot of uh, native endemic animals, such as the pink pigeon, which at one point there were only nine left in the whole world. And now they kind of roam the island. Uh, they had also started conserving the olive white eyes, such a cute little bird, uh, the Fodi and the Telfair skink. Um, one of the sad things is that the Mauritian tortoises had already gone extinct, but they have brought over here from the Seychelles some Aldabra tortoises who are doing really well here on the island. Anyways, back to the shipwreck. When the shipwreck happened, all the oil spilled out onto the surface of the ocean, about 1,000 tons of it. and. The people on the island started getting very, very concerned about the animals and the plants that they've been conserving. So one of the stories that I did at the time was how these nature-loving conservationists here on Ila Zagret painstakingly had moved their animals that they could move and also the plants. So they were relocated all over uh, Mauritius so that they would not be affected by the toxic fumes and also they didn't know what the fuel was gonna do to the ground. And now, on the 7th of December, the island was finally reopened to the public for tours and we just wanted to come back and see how the animals are doing. And on that note, I'll say goodbye for now. Until next time, Liu Fei Fei for CGTN Africa. Well, time now for us to go to a break. Here's what's coming up. As the new year begins, a Kenyan family recalls life under the shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys, the greatest sights, the greatest adventures. Here in Panater, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ugh. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice.
Well, many people across the African continent ushered the new year in without the usual overnight celebrations. Governments across the continent are continuing restrictions to curb the spread of the coronavirus in Kenya. A night curfew forced many to welcome the new year while staying at home. CETN's Enoch Sekolia caught up with one family in Nairobi crossing over to the new year. Yes. And today, I want to make some... Oh, this is the one. Good. Yeah. My name is uh, James Kehato Wamuyururi. I'm a father of two girls. Dad, how are you supposed to do? Yeah. I'm also a consultant in the beverage industry. Good. I'm the fifth born in a family of nine. I come from a very large family. My name is Florence Wairimo Kehato. I'm married, a mother of two. That's gonna be yummy. The year 2020 has been an year that has been very challenging. And a lot of projects that were at hand, all of them, they went down. Because of various challenges, I've been looking forward when the year will come to an end. For me, this year coming to an end is such a big sigh of relief. Oh my goodness, this year, I feel so sorry of myself and my family because every crossover of the year, we have been celebrating with the church and many families together. And there has been a lot of jubilation, relations, and you know, a lot of shouting, a lot of joy. And it's like we are throwing back the old year behind us. But today, we were in church by six. and back in the house by 30, 9 o'clock. So that, that has changed a lot of things in our lives. We are not supposed to exceed the time because of the curfew. Or we are people of citizens, and so we needed to obey the laws of the land, that you can't be out of the house after 10. And so even the pastors in charge, they, were, they knew that they had to let people go back in the houses lest they get themselves into trouble. Because you don't want to have people with you and the next minute you're going to the police station to get them out. This is something that we are going to miss so, so much. We can't be able to shout the way we shout. That excitement is not there. So we are pushed to being calm and just doing things in the normal, you know, the normal setup. However, that does not kill the expectations that we have. My expectations is that we are going to be able to adhere to the rules and regulations that have been set up by World Health Organization. And if we do that, we are going to be able to curb, to curb the effect or the spread of the corona. We've heard about the vaccine that is coming. We're going to embrace this thing. I've had people who are saying that this vaccine is not good, there are many, many stories, but from a personal perspective, I would encourage everyone to go for it because it will help us to reduce the fatality of, the, of this virus. Your sport news coming up after the break is what you can expect. Kenyan para rower Miriam Amakobe still chasing Tokyo Paralympics ticket. How would you create your legend? On the fields, on the tracks, in the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene, fine. Africa Live. Find your voice. Well, let's now take a look at what's happening in sport. The coronavirus pandemic has affected many athletes since governments imposed tough restrictions to combat the virus.
for Kenyan at Pararoa, Miriam Amakobe, the pandemic hit home when her Paralympics debut at Tokyo 2020 was deferred to 2021. TDT's Muhammad Ababaka has her story. Miriam Amakobe takes to the water for the first time in many months. Before the coronavirus landed in Kenya, she was getting ready for a chance to earn a PR2 para rowing ticket to the Tokyo 2020 Paralympics. Sign a prepare for qualification, the PR2 category. I'm now preparing for the para rowing PR2 category qualifiers for Tokyo. They were supposed to be held in May 2020, but the coronavirus pandemic forced a postponement of this event to March 2021. In March. Throughout the lockdown period, Miriam has struggled to train. Unlike many athletes who kept in shape through home workouts, she desperately needed to get back to the water. There was that period where the government stopped all activities and we could not come to train in the water. For this sport, training at home is not the same as when you train in the water. I've been seeing athletes being creative, training at home for fitness. But for me, and the category I'm in, coordination is key. That's why we need to be in the water. Her challenges did not end there. Miriam competes in the doubles category, but her new partner for the upcoming qualifier doesn't live in the same city. In the meantime, veteran Pararoa Swale Faki has been training with her after the Kenyan government lifted restrictions on sporting activity. I wish her all the best in the qualifiers. Miriam has been my partner for a long time in the past. The rules of the PR2 category is that your partner has to be of a different gender but with the same type of disability. And that's why I'm here to help her train and be best prepared. Same type of disability. Miriam draws inspiration from teammate Asiya Mohamed, who secured her Tokyo 2020 Paralympics ticket in 2019. My teammate Asiye had gone through so many obstacles, but she still managed to qualify in the end. I was so excited that day. I immediately shared the news to a group and told them that we also have a chance because we had been training well. She now hopes to reunite with her partner soon as they seek to roll their way to Japan. Mohamed Abubakar for CGTN, Mombasa, Kenya. Meanwhile, the Kenyan kayaking and canoeing team also experienced challenges with training due to the country's pandemic restrictions. Some members of the team have been using their free time to train and mentor young and upcoming kayakers and canoers in Mombasa. Training was easier when the whole team was around, but since March 2020, it's been challenging because of the restrictions on sporting activities. So I've since been volunteering training upcoming kayakers and canoers. Hopefully, by the time the coronavirus pandemic is over and full training resumes, they'll have learned a lot. <laughs> I've been interested in this sport for a while now, seeing it on TV and of course through Diana. She has been of great help to my development and she's been training and mentoring me since. We've dedicated our free time to train others new into the sport. You can't say no to those who are interested. Back then, this sport was very popular among the Navy men and women, but now the sport is growing immensely. We have kayaking and canoeing teams from all over the country. We have one in Ruiru, one in Busia, and even in Kisumu. In England, vast areas of the country are now under Tier 3 or Tier 4 restrictions. A new variant of the coronavirus has been spreading across the nation. Premier League sides Liverpool and Everton were the only top flight clubs still allowed to host 2,000 fans inside their stadia under Tier 2 restrictions. But for now, all professional sporting events will be played behind closed doors until further notice. The news comes a day after West Bromwich Albion manager Sam Allardyce called for a temporary halt to the Premier League season to act as a circuit break amid rising COVID-19 cases at top flight clubs. Arsenal manager Mikel Arteta believes there's no need for a temporary halt to the season as his side is set to visit the Horsens on Saturday in their next Premier League outing. I think uh, we are all concerned uh, with our own health. 
and as well with uh, what is going on around us. But I 